Welcome to the Goddess Deeds crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Goddess Teens Crowd. This is Jason Broughton. Today we have back with us Carl Fabricius. Welcome back, Carl. Hi there, Jason. Good to be back again, finally. Yeah, it's uh, it's been difficult to uh, lasso you in, so to speak. Uh, you've been traveling around, uh, but I did have the great joy of hearing you give a presentation at the Bugenhagen Conference uh, last week. And what came to the forefront in that is how much of a playground the scriptures is and how you kind of just frolic in it, pick up on words and phrases and just kind of pull that thread until you've kind of seen how that either word, phrase, or concept plays itself out throughout all the scriptures. So what do you have for us today? Like what... um, what apparatus on the playground are we going to be frolicking in today? Well, you know, it's not like the Olympics. It's better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so no, we're going to look a, a little bit. I, I, when I was doing that presentation, I, as always, what happens, you get into the context of these things, and it is a playground. So all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you're going one direction, you hit up against something, and this word forsaken I became intrigued by because there's so many little things when you pull on it, it, you end up in different places and different concepts behind it. And so it's the Hebrew word atzab. And uh, I decided just to sort of go as I always do when I get intrigued by these things. How is that used in Genesis or does it even show up in Genesis? Mm-hmm. And uh, as always it does. And fascinating because it shows up in Genesis 2 mm. and that's its first usage and it's Genesis 2 24 a man shall leave of course is the translation but it's that forsaken word so he's forsaking his father and his mother and he's doing that as he's joined to the uh, his wife you know to Eve there and it's, it sets the foundation by going there and seeing that you go oh that's sort of that good foundation for all that bride bridegroom imagery and all the connection to the forsaking that Israel does and all these other things, uh, the adulterous Israel. By just seeing right away it's at Genesis 2, it helps you see that this word has an important, particularly when you get to the prophets, but yes, throughout the Old Testament, it's an important word. Now, to sort of develop that theme a little bit more it's interesting that the term is used several times in the potiphar's wife and joseph episode Mm. first potiphar actually leaves everything forsakes his possessions gives them all over to joseph Mm -hmm. and then of course potiphar's wife tries to take his clothing and uh joseph forsakes or leaves his garment in the hands of potiphar's wife because of course He is clinging to the God who has called him and made him his own servant there. And in fact, the Lord is merciful to him then as we get to the end of that chapter. So it's a very nice sort of tying it together with fleeing from adulterous ways. You had the beginning of Genesis where you had the establishment of marriage. And you're setting up thoughts of how we all need to be more like Joseph, we could say, who... Mm flees from the things of this world, forsakes them instead of clinging to them. And that's a, going to be the problem throughout. Of course, we could point to Joseph's weakness here too, because he marries the woman in Egypt who is, you know, the daughter of Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And there are some complications certainly because of that. But it's the truth that all of us are faced with these same things. Now, even think about this in terms of, since it started with the marriage thing, and I, I'm kind of varying off my first pro, but it just makes you think in terms of all those don't marry those who are of 
the nations around you. Mm -hmm. you know, that whole theme, because it leads to your adulterous ways, the inclusion of the Baals. I mean, even the Genesis 6 reference to the fact that the sons of God are pursuing the daughters of men. And, you know, it's not about giants, just so everybody knows. <laughs> Since you have that whole curious Jewish take on it. No, it's about the fact that we are um, called and need to remember the establishment of marriage is also linked to the uh, talk about faith. It's talked about how our union with God is involved. There's all kinds of things you can uh, bring up in that. And this helps the preacher give references that can illustrate more the need for faithfulness among us. Mm -hmm. um, so, in other words, like you've got these two opposites, um, leaving, forsaking, versus holding fast and clinging. And if you are leaving, forsaking one, you are necessarily holding fast and clinging to another. Yeah, you can't play in the middle. You know, gotcha. It's not, not like you can hang out right there and say, I'm just neutral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody is really neutral. <laughs> You're so, always one way or the other. So does this then play out in the resurrection narrative when Jesus says, don't cling to me? Now, I do not see that connection, but now you're making me think. I need okay. to pursue that maybe and think of that has a little bit to do with it. Although, that would take a little bit of work. Yeah. Can't do that right now. We're supposed to do, be doing this podcast. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I, that is, this is what you do when you play with those things. Now you're in the playground, Jason. In the playground, you know, you may be, digging in the sand and say, oh, what are they doing there over there on the slide? Maybe mm -hmm. I should go over there because maybe that has something to do with what I'm doing here. Um, now, that maybe wasn't the best analogy, right. but uh, you, at the same I, time, I get the point. you look around and you make <laughs> connections. Right. <laughs> uh, so back to Genesis, because you have an interesting reference in Genesis 44 then, where Judah recounts the story of appearing before the Lord of Egypt and says that if Benjamin, the son of my right hand, forsakes his father, his father would die. So sort of a Christological thing going on there. You should think in terms of the father who sends his son into the world. I mean, you've got Judah talking about it, uh, bearing witness about it, and one can't help but make a little connection to New Testament language there, I think, mm -hmm. and bring that into the illustrations. Um Genesis twenty four twenty seven is the context of finding a wife for Isaac. And the servant confesses that the Lord God of Abraham has not forsaken his mercy and truth toward Abraham. Remember, you had the beginning of Genesis and the marriage where God brought the woman to the man. And again, in this context, the woman is brought to the man through these events of the servant going. And God brings the woman to the man. And uh, this is an example of God's own mercy and truth. He doesn't forsake those ways. Um, Isaiah 54, we'll jump a little bit here, is tied in. But eh, let's go back to Genesis. The promise not to forsake Jacob at Bethel. God says he won't do that. And, of course, that's part of those seeing the patriarchs and the connection of the word where God is never wanting to forsake his people. He desires to always be faithful to them. Mm -hmm. um, and all that important for what lies ahead. Deuteronomy has references at, in 12 and 19 about not forsaking the Levites who has no inheritance among you. Now, I think that's, you know, might people might just sort of pass over that. They don't like some of those references. I think it's a nice tie-in to even the language you get in Galatians, for example, that the laborer being worthy of his hire type thing, and that you should, in fact, support those who are preachers, uh, a nice tie-in to um, the responsibility of the hearers to their pastors. Mm. Um, because when you talk about the Levites, they were not given the same things. And so often talking about them is a way to talk about the responsibility we have to pastors in the church today. Now, I know. People get nervous about that because they don't want to bring that in, but it really is. Uh, 
important to realize some connections like that along the way. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Deuteronomy 28.20 is already talking about them forsaking the Lord. They forsake the covenant. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah are often mentioned in connection with this forsaking, by the way, that the people are actually, in, by doing this, becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's, to Israel, that should have made a big deal. And even to us today, I know that people worry about telling this story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in catechesis class, I sure hope that pastors are bringing that story across yet today, not skipping over, worrying it's too offensive. And in fact, as they get older, making sure they make some specific references to what's going on in that text, because it just comes up. And I, I knew it did, but it's funny how in this pursuing this text, Sodom and Gomorrah keeps showing up all over the Old Testament and, of course, become important for our Lord's preaching, too, as we know. So when modern-day preachers are someday times embarrassed by this text or, I don't know, I wonder if it shows up in the CPH Sunday School material still. That'd be an interesting question. Yeah, Do you know anything be. about that? So. Um. Yeah, it might be in the Bible history. It probably is in their revised Bible history. But yeah. the question is, too, what kind of illustrations do they have beside it? Often they will, in kind of modern Bible histories, update their illustrations to make them either look cartoonish or take away the, the, the God of the law or the God of wrath. Yeah, I I like the older approach where you got real art, right. and perhaps a fleeing sometimes a picture of Lot's wife. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly seeing the fire coming down from heaven. Uh, all of that. I need. I think that imagery needs to be with us. Um, there needs to be the imagery of the wrath of God mm -hmm. that all of us hear about. Now, as I get into this text you find the people warn that they will rise and pl play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land they will forsake me and break my covenant he he warns them up front you know how we always say oh we'll we'll be fine we won't do those things i mean right by the time you get to the book of joshua you have the epic scene at the end of joshua as he really does it delivers his last sermon and uh you <laughs> He says to them, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, everybody loves that phrase. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. But the whole context, again, sometimes you need the whole story. And I think preachers often neglect that the phrase sounds so good and it makes a nice, nice plaque to put on the wall at your house. I know. But at the same time, you know, the people say, oh, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, they, they go through this whole thing, right? They're mm -hmm. talking about how they believe that. And then Joshua just flat out says, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people say, no, but we will serve the Lord. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, now, uh, on the one hand, you learn from that story, it's good to say, yes, we want to be faithful. Right. I mean, this is like confirmation day. You know, people would say to you, how can you have those children that make those promises, blah, blah, blah. Well, in a sense, all of us have to be confronted by these words yeah. and confronted by confessing faithfulness in the midst of the world. And yet we have to be warned, you know, you cannot serve the holy God because we become witnesses against ourselves. Mm. I mean, this is another strong part of this forsakenness is that, we are the witnesses that testify against ourselves. So we need to know, on the one hand, we've made those promises because repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
We mm-hmm. promise to be faithful to those words. We promise to serve him alone. And when we don't, we have to be called back, which is always what the Lord does throughout the Old Testament and what John the baptizer does and what Jesus does and what we still have to do in the church. We don't say, well, the times there are changing and sing the Bob Dylan song, you know, <laughs> we, because it's not just blowing in the wind. There is more to more to this than that. We mm-hmm. say, you need to be restored. You need to come back. You need to be returned to the truth. So while they forsook God, and at times it seemed that God forsook them, really, he always desires not to forsake. He desires to, in fact, bring them back. They are the ones that break the covenant. They are the ones that do that. And the same thing is still true. I'm using the term they. We are still the ones who need to be called back. I mean, the importance of confession and absolution can be talked about here with this whole Mm -hmm. confrontation. Even the first time you admit the young to communion, first communion and whatever age that is, you still need to have a sense of reminding them of the need for repentance. And I always did have confession and absolution with them, even if it wasn't, you know, just exposing them to the right. Yeah. So that you bring them and that they know this is something that needs to be part of the life of the church because you cannot serve the holy God. It is a truth on the one hand because he is this jealous God. And Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just say, I'll go out and go on my own way. On the other hand, by the time you get to some of these other references, um, you know, this. I was talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. You also have Isaiah 1, which has all kinds of Sodom and Gomorrah language tied into the forsaking of God um, and that they'll be consumed. Um, That has to be sort of brought out. Now, all this may seem as if uh, it's a little bit negative, but you get to the prophets and that whole forsakenness, the fact that they've forsaken God is addressed I mentioned Isaiah 54, Um, the Lord calls them and says they are like a woman forsaken and a youthful youthful wife when she was refused. Again, that marriage Mm -hmm. language in there. And then says, for a mere moment, I have forsaken you. See, what seemed to them as if, oh, it's terrible, God has just left us in the dust. It's a mere moment, I have forsaken you, but with great mercies, I will gather you. Mm-hmm. I thought it was about time I went to the other side of the equation here because, you know, it can, as you go through this, there's so much sort of that heavier law sense of it. But why does God want the law to kill us? He wants it to kill us so that he can make us alive again. Mm-hmm. That always has to be happening in this process. And so for a mere moment, I have forsaken you, but with great mercies, I will gather you. Then you get to Isaiah 62, a very famous section uh, where no longer will they be called forsaken, but Hephzibah, my delight, Mm -hmm. and Beulah, my married one. And then in the next verse, the holy place, the redeemed, or not in the next verse, it's actually verse 12. um, The holy place, the redeemed of the Lord, sought out a city not forsaken. You know, the very city that earlier God says will be a forsaken, desolate city is also the city that is sought out by God still. Mm -hmm. His people are taken into captivity, but of course you'll have the language about Cyrus and Isaiah and the bringing back and the 70 years as Isaiah or Jeremiah spells it out. Yeah. Um, All of this so that you see that God, who may for a mere moment forsake, I mean, has God ever forsaken the New Testament church? At times, it may have seemed bleak and things, but historically, it was always preserved. You know, it was never destroyed, and it still will not be destroyed. I mean, you could look at the American church as a whole and Christianity and say, Mm -hmm. what a mess, what a disaster. (laughs) And yet, God always has this way of preserving those who are really as faithful. He's Mm -hmm. constantly seeking them out, which is a nice third article. So this forsakenness can also help you talk about the third article. God continues to seek us out. He continues to call us by the gospel 
and do what needs to be done for us and desires to bring us back just like he desired with Israel. Um, the um, You get into that 32, that long song, and that God, in fact, says that when their power is gone and no one remains for them to turn to, God is going to actually be merciful still. Mm-hmm. Um, so is and, this is there a sense in which, uh, I mean, does this term pop up, and it doesn't, I don't recall it, in what happens in the book of Judges? Because you almost get the impression that that's what's happening, right? They forget, they forsake, and then he forsakes them, hands them over to their enemies, and then that causes them to cry out again. Well, now you're on a good track. You're playing in the right, because exactly that does happen. Right away in Judges chapter 2, the children of Israel do evil in the sight of the Lord. Mm -hmm. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And that phrase is always to be tied to who God is. He's the deliverer. Mm -hmm. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, I know that's sort of maybe simplistic, some people say, but I know there's some some families out there and children listening to this, and they need to remember, every time you hear that phrase, remember, that is a foreshadowing of what Jesus does for us. He takes us out of our Egypt, out of the prison house of death. He takes us and brings us, and he becomes our Joshua, who lands us safe on Jordan's side, to quote an old hymn phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, That's his work. Um, They forsake, they go after other gods, they bow down to them, and this is what happens among the faithful. They get tangled up in the idols of this world even as simplistic at times as being their own children become their idols. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. this whole Sunday sports and my kid has to be in volleyball and my kid has (laughs) to be in baseball. And and I love all those sports. Don't get me wrong. I mean, my kid did a lot lot of them too. And probably at times I was a little bit idolatrous too, although I didn't have anybody go to the Olympics or winning NCAA titles or anything like that. But at the same time, you're, Children can be kind of take center stage. I mean, let's face it, your spouse can at times. These are all idolatrous things that become gods in the way of the God who is most important. Mm -hmm. And it provokes the Lord to anger, ultimately. So the anger of the Lord becomes hot there in Judges 2. And wherever they go out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity. And he had told them that was the way he had sworn that to them. And they didn't listen. Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, and here's sort of the, how this conclusion of this whole thing is important. Then you get nevertheless. Even though all, all this was happening, even though they're distressed, even though there's calamity that the Lord's raising up, nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Now, that plundering, remember, what had they done when they left Egypt? This is yeah, sort of babe. one of those game yeah. moments. You're in the, you're in the playground, and they leave Egypt, and they're to plunder their neighbors, right? They mm-hmm. take from them the gold and all that. I mean, that's an amazing. That story always gets me. I mean, they just handed things over to the Israelites after all those plagues. And mm-hmm. you know, first of all, you're an Israelite. You're told to do that. You have to have faith to even go do that, because. That's a really weird thing to be told. Just go to your neighbors, and they're going to hand you over the gold and jewels. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And yet, here, they're being plundered now. God has handed them them, over. God's treating them like Egyptians. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or like the really reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Yeah. yeah, The need for judgment to come upon them. Um, So yeah, that judge's language comes up. And then Oddly enough, right in the middle of Judges, you get Judges 10, a long account of them serving the Baals. Now, that comes after you've had Gideon, but then you've had, of course, the strange rise of his son, Abimelech, and that whole, you know, my father is king name that he had. Mm -hmm. And the children of Israel, meanwhile, in chapter 10, they have forsaken God. And God has a speech in which he says, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites? 
and from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines. And he goes on and, and but you have forsaken me and gone mm-hmm. after their gods. And so they cry out. Um, they put away the for, foreign gods and his soul, God's soul, could no longer endure the misery of Israel. He's inclined, of course, as he always is, to show mercy. And then the people gather together, um, the Ammonites gather together, I should say, against them. And the children of Israel are encamped. And the Gileadites say to one another, Who, who's going to fight against these people? I mean, I love this. They've just repented. They've actually, you know, turned to the Lord. He's shown mercy to them. And yet they're asking the question, who is the man who will begin the fight against the people of it? And that, of course, is an important question that you get even like when Saul becomes king, much the Mm -hmm. same. How is this guy going to save us? And, of course, it's really the question of the Gospels. Who is the man? I mean, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Who is the man who's really going to bring the fight? Mm. Who's really going to do it? And then I love the end of John's gospel. I know I'm too repetitious about this, but that moment when you have the proclamation, behold the man, here's the guy who's coming. He's the one who's going to do the fight. So oddly enough, the one who's going to do the fight in Judges 11 is Jephthah. I mean, the guy who is, you know, the outcast, the one who's, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. You, you got a mess there, and yet he's the one God raises up and through him shows mercy. Now, we've talked about Jephthah and all that calamity of that, but it's still... Is, th- is there a sense in which, like, Jephthah as the outcast um, is a, a type of our Lord Jesus in that there was no... You know, there's no comeliness that we would be drawn to him. That kind of I think that kind so. of thinking. Yeah. Uh, well, and of course, what do they always say about Jesus? That you keep hearing in the Gospels. Well, isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah. Right. In other words, just sort what of what good can come from Nazareth, <laughs> and what good can come from Nazareth? You know, these kinds of things that they were constantly throwing at him. Yeah, he's not the one, and he certainly doesn't have royal looks to him or anything mm-hmm. like that. And But, you know, if, in fact, you're the son of God, why don't you come down from the cross? Mm-hmm. Save yourself. So you yeah. get that whole language. The Christological thing, I think, always has to be, you have to be raising the question, every judge should be thought of as a picture of Jesus, all of them with their shortcomings. I mean, let's face it. The ultimate king picture of Jesus is David, and look at him. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the end, this is what we have, all these pictures pointing to the one, we need somebody to go into battle for us. Just like in Egypt, they had to be brought out. So in the days of Jephthah, there needed to be one raised up. But Gideon, all those people are those who were the ones God raised up. so, so the the message here is, uh, you know, as we're pulling this thread of forsakenness, that you should beware of who you're clinging to, or, or or take care to watch over what you're clinging to. Is that is that the and, and how does Jesus a- how does Jesus kind of point that way forward into what in his own life and ministry what he clings to. Well, and even remember the Sermon on the Mount connection, that I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill mm-hmm. them. And then he gives a you know, nice sermon on the commandments that just kills us all and lays waste to us <laughs> because he doesn't let us say, well, outwardly I'm fine, because he goes right to our hearts, <laughs> right. stabs them. And you know, he's taking up that whole thing of, you know, this is what I want you to do. I want you to cling to me and to who I am. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy mm-hmm. laden. He's always calling. This forsaken language shows up too in Isaiah with reference to the poor and the blind and the lame. Much as we were more familiar with that passage when he's in Nazareth and he quotes, what is that, Isaiah 61? Is that the right section? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And so, but it's those who were forsaken are not these poor and the, because he's going to make sure they have what they need. He watches over them. He cares for them. And uh, certainly that, well, Isaiah 61 is a direct reference. You've got these other references throughout Isaiah that I think just amplify that, um, that God doesn't forsake those who are in need. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just quoted him. God never will <laughs> forsake in need the one who trusts in him indeed. <laughs> um, so how does this come into the Greek from the Old Testament, so from the Septuagint? Does that same word uh, line up to how when Jesus quotes Psalm twenty two, um, and does it does it yes. find itself You're jumping ahead? Oh, okay, sorry. But I think it's an important jump because we are deep into the podcast at this time. So, um, yes, it in fact um, is the same word. It's catalipo, and has some related forms too within it, but that's the basic form that you see mm -hmm. usually used for this term in the Old Testament. And that one that you referred to, the Psalm 22 quote, of course, is the, I would say, the most famous one. You see it at Matthew 27 and Mark 15. Um, it's really, I think, Jesus reminding the witnesses that are there, their, that their complaint um, had been that, indeed, um, God had forsaken them and not cared for them. In fact, I made this quote earlier in the paper. They, they say, have not these evils come among us because our God is not among us? And that, in fact, they've acted as if he's forsaken them and simply, when, in fact, the God, God is always among them, it's just their refusal and so mm -hmm. you're not even sure when that quotation is made, do they even believe in the God who brought them out of Egypt? Or is it just that they're sort of saying, well, what's his problem? He brought mm -hmm. us out of Egypt. He should be taking care of us. You know, aren't we supposed to be blessed by the Lord? <laughs> to quote yeah. sort of a modern contemporary sort of idea. Um, but that's always been sort of the idea. Part of us, you know, in our idolatry, we think, well, he's not taking care of me now. Uh, the whole Job episode, you know, was Job forsaken? No. Job was simply the one who learns to confess, as we all need to confess, that God is ultimately the one who, though we pass away and are dust, yet he'll raise us up to see with our own eyes the one mm -hmm. who has conquered death in the grave for us. So it's, um, yeah, that, Psalm 22 passage is in there, um, and you see as well in there, there's a judgment on Nazareth in uh, where that takes place. He leaves Nazareth behind, mm -hmm. and really when you see that and make a connection to that Old Testament forsakenness, you're seeing God turn his back, really. He's, Nazareth has, has rejected him, and he is turning his back on them. Mm -hmm. um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of the people, and certainly the forsaking that goes on, say, in the days of Jeremiah, those false prophets, etc. Uh, the temple gets forsaken. Um, all this, by the way, is in Isaiah and Moses both say all these things are going to be, you know, men will use these things as in idolatrous ways. They will not recognize when God is right there for them. Instead, they'll look for gods that don't even, you know, gods of rock that don't even have eyes and ears and don't mm -hmm. react in any way. This is always the way of men in the world. Um, you know, I'm sure last week some of our pastors and some of our people were, I haven't, I've kind of ignored it, but I know there was some kind of big crash in the market and mm -hmm. that probably led to a lot of panic among many because it is the way of our flesh to get tangled up in those concerns you know is this good mm -hmm. how is this going to affect me what's happening should this and well on the one hand you have to prepare for those what happens is you get sucked in don't you mm -hmm. and in our idolatry we worry somehow maybe because we think we have to fix this we have to be the ones who and ultimately 
God provides for his people. It may mean less, etc., but at the same time, it is there for us, and we have to learn to rejoice in that. Um, the other things to note in the New Testament, um, you've got, of course, there's the quotation of Genesis 2.24 that Jesus right. uses. Um, that shows up. Um, he quotes Psalm 8. Um, when he leaves the temple, he forsakes the temple, you could say, and goes down to Bethany, the house of affliction. I kind of like that. He moves from the temple to Bethany, the house of affliction, and um, does it after quoting Psalm 8. You know, then comes you know, some Mark re- references to the Sadducees. There's the one who the man dies and leaves his wife behind with no children, so you get the lever right marriage discussion there. Um, interesting one is Mark fourteen fifty two. Uh, the young man flees, forsaking his linen cloth. And after reading uh. that Joseph narrative, I can't help but think, hmm, is there sort of a reference there? Here's a guy who was sort of Mark hanging in the, I've, as traditionally we say is Mark, and I still hold to that. Yeah. Um, but there in the garden, kind of following along, and he leaves that linen cloth behind. By the way, I've, that is fascinating, the linen cloth there. Same word for the linen cloth in the grave. Okay. Um, so there's that connection there. The, the idea, though, that the disciples flee, leave and flee, is not the same word. It's a fia me. Mm-hmm. Now, that's within a couple of verses of each other. All the disciples flee. They leave and flee. Whereas this young man forsaking his linen cloth, his comfort, running away naked, like, I can't help but think, but Adam in the garden, of course, mm-hmm. and uh, all that. But to make those connections to the Old Testament, I think that preachers need to do that, as well as that linen cloth connection I mentioned. And then say the disciples were fleeing in a different sense, because at that point, they're still kind of confused, aren't they? They're mm-hmm. wondering what's going on, and they're, you know, they they go and lock themselves up in fear. They don't know what's going to happen, and even when he is ascending, even at that point, they're wondering if he's going to restore the kingdom. You know, <laughs> that line always gets me. You know, so they've been with him forty days. He's been teaching them, and they ask him, "Oh, now are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel?" <laughs> it is just kind of a fascinating way, and that illustrates the way of flesh and the way of our people in the parish as pastors and the way of our children uh, who've been taught the faith in our own households. It's just again and again, you have these connections that are important to make. Mm -hmm. Um, Matthew in Luke's gospel leaves all to follow Jesus. He forsakes everything to follow Jesus. Oddly, that doesn't happen in Matthew's gospel. (laughs) Not the same word. Um, Martha complains that Mary has left her go after one um, lesser to go uh, well to go after the one thing needful mm-hmm. when really that's the importance of the one thing needful um, Luke 15 4 the leaving and forsaking the 99 in the wilderness to go after one lost sheep and find it oh. um, nice one in terms of the mercy of God and all along how he was trying to rescue his people um, of course he's addressing the two groups there, the tax collectors and sinners who are coming in repentance versus the Pharisees and the scribes there, who of course are the critical ones who don't see him standing right before them. Um, John 8 verse 9, I know it's that account that we have all that debate about, but the accusers forsake the adulterous adulterous woman. They Mm. leave her alone. Which is an interesting thing as well, because you know, she in the end becomes the faithful one, the one who, you know, is restored. Go and sin no more. It's that good repent for the kingdom of heaven is right there. Yeah, you were guilty of these things. You had forsaken me. I want you back. Um, is this uh, word used in conjunction with Peter's sermon about Jesus not being uh Abandoned to to Hades? No, it's okay. not. 
I actually thought of that and was hoping it was. Sometimes you get going in these things and you go, oh, I hope that's there. <laughs> mm. It's not, which was unfortunate. Let's see. Let me make sure I am. I, well, it's from Psalm 16, right? Yeah, actually, it is. Sorry about that. I'm looking at the wrong page here. And yeah, Acts 2, 27 and 31, both the word is there. Okay. Um, yeah, he was not forsaken by his father, which is a nice reference. Thank you for correcting me since I well, got I just off was track on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes questions help to correct the flow. Oh, okay. I go off and jump around. That's the thing about playing in the playground. You know, it, Jason, all of a sudden you get distracted. I'm just like a little kid sometimes having too much fun. <laughs> so, so he, Jesus prays, uh, you know, why have you forsaken me? And yet he's not forsaken because his flesh does not see corruption. He's not forsaken to Hades. Right. And in fact, I'd say he's quoting Psalm 22 because the whole Psalm then is about how he's not really forsaken ultimately. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he's really taking the words, the people complain and say that God has forsaken them. Mm -hmm. And here is the ultimate answer to that question. No, he hasn't. There he is at the cross. Mm -hmm. There he is suffering and dying. There he is taking the sins of the entire world upon himself. This is not God forsaking men. This is the God who is doing everything to save them. You know, it's mm -hmm. the John 3 language. I did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. You know, mm -hmm. I, and people get, this is why the accusation against the church is always, you people are always condemning people, blah, blah, blah. No. We're calling you to repent because there's only one who gives life, and he had to actually die on the cross because of mm -hmm. your sins. So, this in other words, serious the call to repentance is the call to stop forsaking God. Right. So, stop it's leaving stop God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but that that uh, changes the way you know. Often, our calls to repentance are heard. You know, we're we're. We're, it's heard as though we it's a word of condemnation. And instead, it's a word confirming that they have forsaken God. And no, they will be condemned because of their own actions. It's because they're the witness against themselves. Correct. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, I do like that connection to being the witness. I mean, mm -hmm. when they had to sing that song in Deuteronomy 32, because this, they would be witnessing against themselves. Joshua 24 with the word of um, Joshua, you are witnesses against yourself this day. Um, this comes up again and again, and it's really a reminder to us, you know, we're baptized. Mm -hmm. And in the baptism, we were asked, you know, do we forsake the devil and all his works and all his ways? And yes, well, that's supposed to be the way of the faith. You forsake those things and trust instead in the God of your baptism. Mm, right. Um, and I love you leave the those things on behind, that. right. Yes. Leave the things of Egypt behind. <laughs> the, those things you leave behind, you left Egypt and you were led out into the wilderness and you were brought to a new land. Mm -hmm. Even though you grumbled the whole time you were there <laughs> in the wilderness. Yeah. Even though he had to delay your entrance into the land. You were so close. You were right there. In less than two years, you were on the border, and you had to wait 38 and a half years, <laughs> and 40 total, and because of their own forsaking the Lord. Because what happened? You know, they said, oh, we can't do it. They're giants. They're there. I mean, the interesting thing is God in his patience let the first episode go, where, of course, they worshiped the golden calf, and, in fact, Moses pleads for the people and God spares them. I mean, many die in that event, but mm -hmm. still, in his mercy, he let them go on. But their total refusal to trust in him as the God who would lead them into all these people a year and a half before had been led through the waters of the Red Sea. Or not a year and a half at that point. Sorry, I'm thinking of, yeah, roughly a year and a half. I've been led through the waters of the Red Sea. And 
they had seen one of the greatest things of salvation ever, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and yet, witnesses though they were to that, they said, no, we can't go in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is so like the, this is human, this is the way we are. Um, you know, again and again, we trust in that phrase that Disney has made, you know, that too many of our children are taught by parents who are parents who are Christians that you've got to follow your heart. No, please don't. Right. <laughs> I know right. I kind of, re I'm repetitive about this for too, because it drives me insane. Stop doing that follow your heart stuff. Because in fact, that's how the Israel was forsaking the Lord and following their own hearts mm -hmm. uh, in the Psalms actually. And so you, you have that whole problem that we like to go after our own things. Mm -hmm. um, Jeremiah has this telling section in Jeremiah 2 um, where he says, my people, well, first you have, has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? Mm -hmm. But my people have changed their glory. And there you should be thinking, when you hear glory, you should think Jesus. Have yeah. changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, and, and much like at the Psalm, uh, the Song of Moses, they right away referring to creation becomes a witness against men. Yeah. And be horribly afraid. Be very desolate. For my people have committed two, two evils. They have forsaken me, and I love this, the fountain of living waters. Boy, this is what you can tell baptized children who've turned away. <laughs> because yeah. ultimately, well, that John 4 language with, you know, the living waters language in John yeah. 4 and all that. They have forsaken me at the fountain of living waters. Uh, the, these are not just sort of, you know, let me tell you, there were fountains in the wilderness and every, you know, you, they needed to drink water. Well, everybody knows you need to, this. It has to be more about something other. The fountain of living waters, the connection to the Holy Spirit. Uh, they've hewn themselves. Now you have men making themselves cisterns. And the cisterns are broken. They can hold no water. So I, I like that section in Jeremiah 2. Yeah, I think it helps talk about the life of the baptized. And, you know, particularly uh, there are those times, you know, I'm sure you've had all the people love to go look at those confirmation pictures, don't they? Mm -hmm. And what do they say? It was so big all back then. Those people, <laughs> yes, well, they say it was so big. And then they actually realize most of those people aren't even Christians often. Mm -hmm. they, they aren't coming to church. They aren't. I know we're not supposed to say they're not Christian because that would be harsh, don't you know? No, mm -hmm. they've forsaken the Lord yeah. who gave them this gift of bringing them to the... It, we need to call them to repentance, but parents don't want to do that to their children. Pastors get squeegee about that. Squishy, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> about that. Um, but boy, I mean, remember Jeremiah was given no choice. He had to say these words. Um, and so he does. And yeah. Well, you get this, um, I think it's the same word in Hebrews 10, right? Yes. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering and then not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. The neglecting is that that forsaking. Right. It is. Yeah. So it's a nice tie in. Jump ahead and get that for me because you know I get wound up in things and love these old testament things. But that <laughs> yeah, that Hebrews one is quite good. I have it in my notes in the paper and just hadn't gotten to it yet with you. Um but the fact that it ties in the need to gather together as his people, um, even now as the day gets closer, which is always the case, this need to gather together the people of God. Um, what yeah. other New Testament? So now you're holding fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. What's, what's the difference between holding fast to the Lord and the confession of our hope? I mean, is there any uniqueness there? Well, that phrasing. There is the Old Testament language of the hope that was in, particularly in Jeremiah 17, I think it is, where men have left him, and yet the Lord's the hope of Israel. Mm. And those who forsake, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. So, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord. 
the fountain of living waters. So you go back to that phrase again about the fountain of living waters. Mm -hmm. Also that being written in the earth thing. You know, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Now, isn't that interesting that, that John 8 that we just talked about, you have the writing <laughs> on the ground. He writes in the dust there. Mm -hmm. Boy, I've never made that connection until just now. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, nice connection you made, and then it led me to think about this language of the hope. There's another passage I think in Isaiah. I have too many things in my notes here, and now I'm getting kind of... Let's see. Well, before you get there, so when you begin pulling these threads... Do you just go back to the Hebrew and start reading and look for these verses, or do you search them out like, I'm going to look for forsaken in English and see what those words are and then start looking for that in Hebrew, or do you just search in Hebrew? I just do Hebrew search. Mm -hmm. and so uh, like a computer program that, that helps you with that. No, I don't. Because, uh, you know, I, I don't have that. I just have, um, now, you younger guys all have that, I'm sure. Yeah, but I have the old Solomon Mandelker, and I'm doing this by hand. The problem is, man, the print is small on that thing. The older okay, I so get, the harder so you it is. So you have a Hebrew concordance-like? Yes. Book? Yeah. I have a Hebrew concordance, and I just sort of slavishly, except for me, it's kind of fun. Because mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you run into something and go, whoa. And you discover things that you, now, you can't do this all the time. I know. Right. But I think it's important for pastors to do it as much as possible. Every week, just take and pursue a Hebrew word, a Greek word, in your text maybe for that week. And try to build up. It helps build up your connections throughout the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I have an advantage because I've done it for so many years now that sometimes I'll just look in the concordance, see a passage, and think, well, I mean, that stuff from... Genesis 39, obviously, I go right away. Oh, it's the Joseph narrative. Mm -hmm. Or you, know, you do these things, you see them, and you look at them because you've just done it so many times. And sometimes it's the Isaiah stuff, sometimes Jeremiah. You just recognize texts, um, the Psalm 16 quotations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously, uh, Psalm 27 has forsaken language in it. Um, Psalm 37 and 38, both do uh, the... The um, psalm in particular, uh, oh, where I am, Psalm 38, my heart pants, my strength fails me. That's actually my strength forsakes me, fails in English there at that mm. point. As for the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. You get to the end of that psalm, though. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. And then comes the liturgical can connection from matins make haste to help me O lord my salvation mm. uh, that actually happens again in psalm 40 very similar um where my heart is failing it's forsaken me um and yet deliver me O lord make haste to help me that phrase shows up in several psalms obviously but i like the connection here to the forsaken language and uh the idea of the Lord's deliverance coming What along. is the bit in Job where he says, my heart faints within me? Is there something to that as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got the, does he talk about forsakenness early on? Isn't an argument there, you know, let me just go back. I'm looking at I don't see, but, you know, he's he's not... You have skin destroyed, yet he'll see him in his own flesh. So it's not the same. I don't, I don't think the same words. No, there's not a lot of Job usage okay. of that term. Okay. Job 39 has it. 10, 1, 9, 27. Yeah. I'd okay. have to look a little bit more at that. Um, but I, to go, because I am old. <laughs> I like Psalm 71 here. Um, nice prayer here. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying, 
God has forsaken him. You know, this is the way the enemies are. You know, pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. There's the phrase again, of course, from the liturgy and the importance of that prayer, uh, because the enemy is, you know, until you, the day you die, Luther's idea that, the, you know, on your deathbed, the devil's going to attack you and go whole hog on you because he wants you to believe God has forsaken you. Right. You know, look, you're suffering, you're dying, you're in pain. It's all awful. Mm -hmm. And so the attack is full and forward, but the prayer is there. Do not cast me off. And then Psalm 71 goes on a few verses later and says, Oh God, you have taught me from my youth. And to this day, I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray headed, O God, do not forsake me mm -hmm. until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone and who is to come. Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. You have done great things, O God, who is like you? And that's always an important question. Who is God like you, O Lord? Shows up several times along the way. And uh, certainly the prayers of the Psalms bring out that language as well. Mm -hmm. um, and in our old age, it is actually when it becomes most clear that all we have to really cling to is God and his mercy in Christ. Like there, everything else God fades everything away. away from us. Yeah. I mean, you know, you no, it's don't, not you that can't he's forsaken us. He's, the things you used to do. he's helped us forsake all the other things. There's nothing else that we can cling to. Yeah, he's slowly making us realize there's only one thing you can turn to. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I meant, made mention of Psalm 27, and it, of course, is good. Because there you get, when my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Mm. Um, nice connection to the language even Jesus says, uh, if you don't leave further father or mother, that language, it's grounded in this whole forsaken language too, I'm pretty convinced. Because, you know, you have been my help, do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. So ultimately, the whole call of all of us you, you aren't to love father or mother more than him mm. uh, because he's the one who created you, who formed you in your mother's womb, who gave you life. And while you are to honor them and indeed love them at the same time, they can't be loved more than him mm -hmm. because you can't forsake him for them. Right. Um, so, well, and that goes the same way with the Kings and the princes of the land and, Right. Fathers in office. Yeah. Connection in a couple of Psalms to waiting. This forsakenness or temptation to think we're forsaken. We just need to wait for the Lord. Mm. And that, that's an important point as well. You see this for Psalm 37. Um, there's this idea of those who forsake the law. Um, those who wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. Kind of made me think of... Uh, the words there in Psalm 37 kind of made me think of the Beatitudes, a couple phrases mm -hmm. in there, and I hadn't thought of that before either. There's always something new in the playground, you know. Mm -hmm. They keep putting in new equipment. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was always except, there, you just didn't realize it. Except, yeah, it was always there. I mean, you just get a missed out on it. There, it doesn't need to be new um, because you keep getting this again and again. The Lord loves justice, does not forsake his saints. Mm -hmm. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Now, the world says, hey, everybody dies. No. Mm -hmm. The saints are not forsaken. They are preserved forever. They rest in peace. Yes, their bodies decay into dust, but Job is right. To go back, I know I've quoted him too much today. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is this is great fun. Um, so, what else do you have in store for us down the line? Any thoughts that you'd like to pursue? Um, there, I'm not quite sure where I want to go next. I've because I just got done having my son and grandsons here. My mind has kind of gotten obliterated for a few days, so <laughs> I'll have to 
I should have known you were going to ask me that question, but <laughs> I'm going to confess at this point, I have some ideas, I know, but just when you ask it like this, I'm suddenly blank. Another yeah. problem of old age. <laughs> well, you do the same thing to me when you're like, and and where does that story come from? <laughs> I'm like, geez, I don't know what you're thinking about, Carl. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we look forward to whatever you have in store for us in the future. So thanks for your time and uh, can't wait to, to have another play date on the playground of God's <laughs> Word. Always fun. All right. Take care, Carl. Thanks. <laughs>